Today we are going to talk and bring attention to another senseless crime. One that should never have been allowed, but the victim also played a role in the crime itself. This is Emma Jane Walker who was an absolutely gorgeous girl. She was born on March 20th of 2000 in Knoxville, Tennessee, and she grew up in a small town right outside of Knoxville. It was kind of a rural mountain town, very low-key and a religious small area. Her parents are Mark and Jill Walker, and she also has a brother named Evan. Emma was described as being super sweet, very down-to-earth. She was known for being an extremely kind and friendly person that people just loved. People who didn't know her and always thought that she's like a super pretty cheerleader. But then they would meet her but like she's the nicest person I've ever met. People had nothing but positive things to say about her. Truly she had tons and tons of friends and got along with pretty much everyone she came across. Her dream in life was actually being a nurse, not only does she want to be a nurse, but she also wanted to be a neonatal nurse. She wanted to be working with infants in intensive care, or like premature babies. She had that kind of heart. Most people who are nurses are just such good people. Most of the people that know our nurses consider them as salt of the earth type of people. They are really good people out there, and she wanted to be a nurse so that tells you a lot about her. She did tons of volunteer work and specifically, she volunteered at an animal shelter regularly, and she was also really into competitive dance and cheerleading. She entered Central High School as a freshman in 2014, and she tried out for their cheer team and was the only freshman who actually made it on the team. She was very successful with her cheerleading and in high school she was successful overall. She had a ton of different friends and was an honor student. During her freshman year she met a boy named Riley. This is Riley Gall. Riley was two years older than her, and he was a star wide receiver on the football team. Riley was very active in his church, and he was known to be a great student. He was overall just that kind of, the boy next door type. His friends described him as someone who was kind of a nerd growing up was really into Star Wars, and then as he got older in high school, he became very involved with football. Emma ended up having a pretty big crush on Riley, but at the time Riley was dating somebody else. However, it wasn't long until he broke up with that other girl to date Emma. They hit it off right away, especially because they are kind of like a storybook romance, out of the high school perfect world. He's the football star. She's the cheerleader, you know that kind of perfect story. Now one thing that was really weird, is that even though Riley broke up with his ex-girlfriend, he had promised her that he would still take her to the prom. Even though he was already dating Emma at the time, he took his ex to the prom instead in his junior year and then he took Emma to the prom in his senior year, and this made Emma's parents really concerned. They figured he was not prioritizing her, and they were worried about her getting hurt by him now. They expressed concern to her, but she was very stubborn and independent, and really liked to make up her own mind. She kind of disregarded their concerns when it came to Riley, and that brought some tension in the family regarding this subject. The perfect couple didn't last too long. As time passed, they started breaking up, with a on-and-off-all-the-time relationship. Her friends started expressing concern about the fact that Riley never really seemed interested in getting to know them, or hanging out with them, and that's kind of an odd thing. He didn't really want much to do with her friends, and he also didn't want her to have much to do with his friends as well. His friends said that he started becoming very possessive of her, and then it got to the point where he was mad if she was wearing certain things. He tried to control the way she was dressing. When she was at work he would go to her work and just hang out there for hours waiting for her to get off. Whenever she did go out with her friends there, or to do something with her girlfriends without him there, 
he would be obsessively calling and texting her just blowing up her phone. He totally didn't trust her, wanting to know where she was, what she was doing at all times. This is obviously very unhealthy in any relationship, but especially in a high school one. Eventually he started sending pretty aggressive messages to her on Snapchat. One of them in particular said you're dead to me, I'll check the obituary. He would also threaten that he was going to kill himself if she did not get back together with him. They got into this vicious cycle where they would fight and get really nasty with each other, and then they would make up and get back together. Everything would be good for a while. Then they would break up and start this cycle all over again. Her parents really wanted to try to end this relationship especially since he was so on and off, they were like, this is just better if we encourage her to end it completely. They decided to ban him from coming to their house, and they also took her phone in an effort to try to control her communication with him. However, Riley gave her an iPod touch. She did the double text thing, I don't think a lot of parents like know about that feature or like knew about it. They were able to still communicate without her parents knowing. After dating on and off for two years Riley ended up graduating high school, he attended Maryville College which was was about half an hour away from Emma. Her parents were happy that they had some separation, but obviously it's not that much distance. Emma and Riley decided that they were going to continue dating even after he left for school, and at this point her parents felt like there was absolutely no point in this and they banned her from talking to him at all. However, they still found ways to be sneaky with each other and still communicated. Her parents became so desperate for them to break up. They have such a bad feeling about him that they banned her from leaving the house for any reason unless it was for school or cheerleading practice. After a while of this, her parents noticed that it was starting to work and Emma was really acting like her old self again. She seemed happier, but then things started taking a turn for the worse. It was right before Thanksgiving break in 2016 and Emma ended up seeing Snapchats of Riley with other girls on campus and this really made her upset. After seeing this, Emma decided to break up with Riley for good. She decided that she deserved better than that. Especially if he wasn't going to take their relationship seriously and respect her enough by taking pictures with other girls and whatever else he was doing. Her parents were very relieved, and they felt like this was the time that she was serious about breaking up with him. They were hoping to get the old Emma back. Riley however did not handle the breakup well at all, and right after they broke up, he decided to commit suicide by drinking a bunch of alcohol and taking a bunch of Vicodin pills. Luckily, he did not pass away from this, needless to say he was not taking things very well at all and his friends and family were concerned about him. On Friday night, November 18, Emesis High School had won a big football game, and one of her friends was having a little after-party at her house. Emma's parents decided that she would be allowed to go since it seemed like things have gotten a lot better, and it seemed like she wasn't talking to Riley anymore. Emma was at the party, when all of a sudden, she started receiving these super sketchy texts around 11.30 p.m. Now these text messages were threatening her, saying I've got someone you love. I'm going to harm them, come outside if you don't want to see them get hurt. Obviously, she was very concerned, but she did think that maybe there's a chance it was Riley's friends playing some type of prank on her. Shortly after she got another text that said, he's in a ditch beside her house. It's a shame you can all of a sudden not value someone else's life. This is when Emma and her friend decided that they were going to go outside and just check it out. When they went outside, they saw a man face down on the ground near the bushes near the end of the driveway of this girl's house where the party was being held. It was Riley, and he started waking up and acting super confused having no idea how he ended up there. He said someone had kidnapped him, 
and he had no idea where he was or how he ended up there. They said that he was just holding his head like someone had hit him or knocked him out or something. After he got up, he called one of his friends to come and pick him up. He told his friend that someone had knocked him out, put him in a car and taken him to this house. Even his own friend didn't believe him, and he basically told me that these people knocked him out, took his car, and threw him in a van. He didn't know where he was. She just had a feeling something was odd about the whole thing, and she wished that Riley would just leave her alone and let her move on with her life. The next day, it was around 10.15 a.m. and Emma was home. She was just getting ready to go meet her mom somewhere when someone started banging on her front door, and this really freaked her out. She was home alone so she actually ended up texting Riley and saying that she hated him, but she needed him. He decided to drive on over to her house. When Emma didn't end up meeting her mom where she was supposed to, her mom drove back to their house. This is when she saw Emma and Riley just sitting on the driveway talking to each other. Emma's mom went over there and told him that he had to leave, and he did so. The next day was Sunday, and Emma was still really shaken up about the person banging on her door and the weird text messages about Riley being kidnapped and all of it was just very intense. It seemed like she was starting to calm down on Sunday. She had worked that day, and her parents ended up following her to and from work to make sure she was okay. They were clearly very concerned about her later that night. Emma and her dad went out and got some Sonic and some ice cream, and her dad said he noticed that Emma was starting to act a little bit more like herself. Definitely calming down after the weekend's events, and that just overall she seemed better. So that night they got ready for bed like normal. Her dad said goodnight to her like he always did, and she went to sleep. Then during the middle of the night, her dad heard a really loud banging noise. He said it sounded as if someone was in the house and slammed a door really hard. Her dad woke up and was startled and then he heard it again. He got out of bed and ran to check on Emma and her brother. When he opened Emma's bedroom door he saw her in her bed. Nothing seemed out of normal. She just looked like she was laying there asleep. Emma's dad was just convinced that maybe he was just hearing things. Everything seemed normal in their house. He just went back to bed, but the next morning around 6 a.m. Her parents were getting up getting ready to start their morning routine. Her mom went into Emma's room to wake her up, and she normally was really easy to wake up. She wasn't like one of those people who was impossible to get out of bed. She was normally fairly cheery in the morning and kind of a morning person. Her mom thought it was really unusual that she wasn't responding to her when she first tried to wake her up. She tried bumping her legs. She called her name several times and Emma would not wake up. And instantly her mom knew something was wrong. That's when she looked at her face and she realized that Emma did not have a pulse. She frantically called 911. Paramedics got there fast. They first believed that this was some type of suicide or overdose, or that something happened to her in her sleep, some unknown cause. They had no idea what was going on though. And when she didn't show up at school, word started getting out fast that something had happened to her. That maybe she had overdosed or committed suicide or something like that. It was starting to go around the rumor mill and this is when Riley actually started making some social media posts about her. Emma was such a well-known girl and such a loved girl that this just shocked people. There's a candlelight vigil held for her. There was a lot of public mourning, people just were shocked that this happened to such a young girl and people wanted to know what exactly happened. Detectives showed up at the crime scene. Then they noticed that there was a hole in the wall. Now this hole was only as wide as like a pen, 
there are two bullets that were shot into the corner that her bed was in. The detectives figured that whoever had shot a gun through the wall of the house clearly knew that that was Emma's bedroom and where exactly her bed was. Detectives started trying to talk to her friends and peers and asked if there was anyone out there who would want to harm Emma or who had anything against her and guess whose name kept coming up? Riley. The detectives went to Riley's dorm to talk with him. At this point there was nothing that made police really think he was a strong suspect, and Riley's friends were actually really worried about him because he had recently attempted suicide and now a girl that he used to love is dead. They were concerned he might harm himself. Then one of Riley's friends told detectives something that Riley had told them the Saturday before Emma was killed. Riley apparently told his friend Alex that he had stolen his grandfather's gun as a way of protecting himself after he was kidnapped. His friends were really concerned about him having a gun on him since he was suicidal. But he reassured them that he wasn't suicidal, and he purely had the gun for protection. That following Monday morning, Riley was already considered a person of interest in Emma's death. Detectives started asking him about what he was up to that night when Emma was shot in her bed. They asked him where he was that night, and he said that he was at his friend Noah's house, and they asked did you sleep over? Riley said, I'm pretty sure I did. You would probably remember if you stayed the night at someone's house, especially if it's only been a week or so that passed. The detectives thought how could he not remember something like that? Another thing that just struck them as very strange was he didn't mention Emma's name at all for the entire two hours he's being interviewed. He would continuously describe her as the girl. They said, during the interview they were very concerned about him because he seemed completely emotionless and very detached. Riley ended up telling them that he kept trying to text Emma that weekend, but she wouldn't reply to him and eventually just blocked him and he claimed that she had told him the only way she would see him is if he helped her with her paper. Riley claimed he used one of his friend's phones to call her. He then says he was so upset he left his dorm and drove to his grandparents' house, and he got there around 12.30 a.m., and only stayed for about 45 minutes before coming back to his dorm. He said, at this point he had an emotional breakdown. He said for the next several hours he just sat in his car, crying looking at photos of the two of them together. Detectives started asking him about his grandparents' guns. They asked where they were, how he had access to them, if he ever took one, or had a gun on him at all. Riley of course said no to all these questions and claimed to not have a gun at all. By this time the detectives had already talked to his friends who claimed that he showed them the handgun at school. When they confronted Riley with this information, he basically denied it still and said that he had no idea why his friends were claiming that he showed them a gun. What if I told you someone told us that they saw you with a gun? What would you think about that? I would wonder if he said that and where they saw him with a gun. Alex McCarty said that you showed him a handgun. Where is the gun? I do not know. You understand that for us? Alex has no reason to lie about something like that. Yeah, but I'm telling you, I don't know where he's at. He said that you showed him the gun, you told him that you had it, and you told him that you got it from your granddad. Don't have the gun. I don't know why he would say that. Am I suspect in, in her passing? Should you be? I just feel like I'm being badgered with questions. I hope to God I'm not a suspect in her death. Did I say you were? I hope you don't think it. Because I wouldn't hurt that girl. Did you shoot him in his house? No, sir. At this point Riley is looking really sketchy, but he still continued to deny that he had any possession of a gun. His friend Noah came forward and claimed that Riley had asked him if he knew how to get fingerprints off a gun and obviously Noah said, what the heck, no. Riley had told him that his roommate wanted to know and that's why he was wondering. Obviously, Noah thought this was pretty strange and told the detectives as soon as Riley had left questioning. 
he immediately texted his friend Noah and asked him why the heck he snitched on him about having the gun and the whole fingerprint thing. His friend Noah basically said, well man, if you didn't do anything you should have nothing to hide and you shouldn't be worried about it. Riley ended up telling Alex that he got rid of the gun and it went back to his grandparents' house. Right after this, Riley's mom came in his room and started asking him about the supposed gun and where it was. To which she said, I don't have one. There is no gun. At this point Alex and Noah are starting to feel like if you're lying to your mom and you're telling us a different story that Riley probably did this, like everything's starting to line up. Riley actually asked his friends to no longer speak to the police for the meantime. Riley needed to figure out what to do about the gun and how to get rid of it, because he didn't want to be blamed for something he didn't do. But because Noah and Alex were pretty positive that Riley was the one who killed Emma, they decided to secretly work with the police. They decided that they would help him try to get rid of the gun while secretly working with the police because they knew that was the one bit of evidence that they would need. They thought that if they're able to get fingerprints or connected, you know, it's a pretty slam-dunk situation. The next day Noah and Alex go over to Riley's house to play video games and chill and just like hang out. Riley did not know his friends are actually wearing mics and they have a camera in a key fob that was given to them by the police. While they're hanging out eventually the conversation comes up about Emma and Riley starts denying that he had any involvement again. Riley is saying he had nothing to do with it and that he would never kill her. He also told them that he wanted them to take back their statement they made to the police and just tell the police that they were tripping on drugs, and that's why they were confused. He said that and then he told them that he wanted all three of them to go get the gun and get rid of it. Of course, Noah and Alex are doing a good job, they're playing along, and they agreed to go help him get rid of the gun because he's so innocent. They must help protect him so they all hopped in the car together and the first stop was to his stepdad's house where he got the gun. He hopped back in the car and the three of them went to go grab some fast food, and the gun was just in the car, in a trash bag. Meanwhile, while this was all happening, there were multiple undercover police cars following them. Noah and Alex were also texting the police officers in a group chat letting them know what was going on and what they were doing. They finally got to a parking lot where they were close enough to the river. This is where they decided to get out and bring the gun down to the river and this is when Riley puts on gloves and very carefully starts taking out the gun. Alex and Noah text the police to tell them it's a good time to come on over to the car. The police show up at the parking lot and immediately tell them to get out of the car and put their hands up. Noah and Alex do this immediately because they knew this was going to happen and Riley cooperated, and they immediately arrested him and took him into custody. Riley was then convicted of first-degree murder as well as six other felonies. When the police were going through that trash bag that the gun was in they also found a bunch of black clothing of Riley's from probably that night. This made them believe that Riley was also the man that came and was knocking on her door. Clearly, all the weird events that had happened were Riley. He totally faked his own kidnapping. He was desperate in love with this girl, and she wasn't interested in him. He just finally snapped. In May of 2018 at his trial surprisingly Riley's defense team decided to say that this was not a murder it was a reckless homicide. This kind of actually threw the court off because they were surprised that they were actually admitting that he was the one who shot the gun and they basically were saying that he was hoping that the gun would scare her, and she would call him, and he could come to her defense basically just taking the whole thing up another level. First is the big kidnapping, then it's the person banging on the door. Now, it's someone shooting through the wall. It was all his way to get her attention according to his defense. 
However, the prosecution said that this was total nonsense because of where the bullets actually were shot at. Whoever shot this gun knew exactly where to shoot to kill her. This was not to get her attention they were clearly aimed at her. There was over 30 witnesses at the trial, and it took over a week to get through all the evidence and testimony. On May 8, 2018, Riley was charged with first-degree murder and was sentenced to over 50 years in prison before he will get a chance for parole. This just goes to show and point out that this is a classic case of an abusive relationship gone incredibly wrong. It's a reminder to us all to make sure to look out for other people and our families that are in relationships that could possibly be abusive and to look out for the signs such as people distancing themselves from others, pulling away from a group of friends, isolating themselves to only hang out with their significant other, or has to ask permission from the significant other to do things, or isn't allowed to do certain things because of the set of rules made for them. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back next time of course to bring you yet another case but until then stay safe out there. Please take care of each other. Please take the time and remember to subscribe.